We asked the students to read a piece from the New York Times, The Meat Eaters, by Professor Jeff McMahon at Oxford. We also interviewed um, Jeff over Skype recently about it. It makes some claims that are philosophical in nature, but it also seems to presume certain kinds of empirical um, claims, or at least to assume something about what's empirically possible. So we're very interested in having a real scientist who knows about the empirical world and some of the possibilities in it come and talk about what you thought about the article and whether you think that it has any plausibility. Yeah, so um, it, I mean, it was an interesting hypothesis or uh, idea that he's, he's generated, but I'm, I'm afraid on a scientific level, uh, it, I don't think it holds water. Um, in fact, I, I think it's, it's a pretty bad idea because it really flies in the face of all the knowledge and data that we've accumulated and human experiences that we've accumulated over tens and hundreds and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, one cannot simply kill predators thinking that you will reduce suffering. Um, in fact, you'll probably increase suffering tremendously because of um, trophic cascades and, and the complex relationship of, uh, among species that, that really defines nature. So just to remind us, McMahon's argument is conditional. Right? So he says, if we get to the point, obviously we're not there now and maybe we won't be there for quite a while, but if we get to the point, then he does seem to think that within the next hundred years or so it would be possible. So it's not completely far-fetched Star Trek kind of theorizing. Um, where we could genetically alter the carnivores so that they become herbivores, or we could phase them out without damaging the rest of the biosystem, um, the ecosystem, then we should do so for these ethical reasons. We prevent all the suffering on the part of the prey that the predators would be attacking. And I take it your response is to say, we certainly couldn't do that now. There would be all these consequences which would lead to more suffering and all kinds of catastrophes. What if he were to insist, look, I'm just making this conditional claim. If and when we're able to do that, then we should for ethical reasons. Right. So, so well, there's really several parts to that. First, let me just deal with the, the science of, okay. of what's possible today and, and say for the next 50 years okay. or 100 years. Yeah. Um, if you remove predators, we've done that experiment and uh, ecological catastrophe ensues. We can see that in our own backyards here. We remove wolves. The deer population right, explodes, right, yeah. and now we're at risk of losing our forests yeah. because the deer are eating the understory, eating the saplings, and the forests aren't regenerating. Mm -hmm. In addition, the birds and the salamanders and the species that rely on that understory are dying. Mm -hmm. So we, it's arrogant to think that if we can remove one piece or change the activity of one piece, that the rest is going to behave in a predictable fashion. Mm -hmm. No one thought that 200 years ago that killing the wolf would cause one day the loss of the northeastern forests, right. for example. Um, there's other interactions as well that are a little more subtle. Um, for example, if you remove certain predators mm -hmm. that are good at grooming themselves, you change the ecology of the ticks that live on rodents and live on them. Okay. And so what happens is that can then translate into more human disease, for example, Lyme disease. So these interactions are not always predictable. And again, where do you draw the line? If we are working to change the genetics of, of a coyote or a fox, um, do we go down and have to change the genetics of a tick right. to no longer suck blood? Well, then it's not a tick anymore. So the idea of, of this wholesale changing of nature, there is no nature in that. Hmm. Everything would just be a construct of man with the idea that we would be the judge, jury, and executioner for every species dictating the value of it and what it should and shouldn't be doing and completely obliterating the concept of balance and nature and the complex relationship among species. Is your resistance to the thought experiment based wholly in worries about consequences, unforeseen consequences, or is there also a kind of we shouldn't play God feeling to your resistance? No, I, well, I think it's dangerous to set up arguments where you say, well, science will fix it. Yeah. You know, here's morally why we should do it, and science will just come up with the fixes. I'm a reproductive biologist. Yeah. Um, we don't have the, the sterilization technologies and capability to handle this. We don't have the genetic capabilities. And really, one has to wonder, should we 
is a lion a lion if it's no longer eating meat? Um, there was an argument made in, in his longer work that the human condition or your human experience immediately has us feel sorry for the buffalo that gets eaten by the lions. Um, but I, I reject that notion. I think a lot of people, myself included, mm -hmm. love nature. We love the system. We love the relationships among those species. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we're just rooting for the buffalo. We care equally about the lion and the lion cubs that will, that will die of starvation if they're not allowed to eat. Right. Um, and, and I think we'd have a much poorer world if, if we didn't have, have those kinds of species in it.